Well, I'm really a newbie on all this stuff. I'll start out by saying I'm, I'm the new kid on the block at MasterCoin. I'm, uh, this is my first time really using stock, and I'm fairly new to the Bitcoin development world, really writing my first uh, Bitcoin code uh, at the beginning of this year. So this is just kind of about my experiences, um, what, I, what I've learned, what I'm doing, and I'm hoping to get feedback or maybe get other people involved. Um, I think it's a different path uh, from what other people have been doing, so I, I think maybe people can learn from it. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's my disclaimer. Um, so what the main thing that I've been, that's been driving this work is the work that I'm doing for the MasterCoin Foundation. But I have written a few tests, and I'm hoping that other people can use these tests in the Bitcoin world. Um, so I will, I'll start, uh, well, the, so the agenda is to talk about the issues with testing Bitcoin in the blockchain. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Bitcoin 2.0, at least as what it, what it means in the master coin world. Um, anybody here a, a Java developer? Yes, yes. <laughs> Two? <laughs> Java just is not cool. <laughs> well, there's a language called Groovy that is, you can kind of think of it as Java++ or Java++ uh, plus Ruby or Python that is a really nice uh, solution in the Java space, and that's the Spock framework uses the Groovy language. So we're able to take advantage of the Java platform, but not write in quite a verbose language. So I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll be showing you some code there uh, so you can see how nice it looks. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the Bitcoin Java ecosystem, and then the main thing is I wanna show you guys, some, walk you guys through some test code. Um, I have Q&A at the end, but uh, feel free to, to, you know, this is going to be informal, so feel free to pipe in at any time with questions or comments or, or uh, moans or groans or whatever <laughs> the case may be. Um, so how many people are familiar with unit testing and testing terminology? Yes, yes, yes. yes. That half. It's kind of a, a landmine, really. Um, <laughs> We talk about unit tests, um, and, and then that term kind of encompasses all the others, although there are some distinctions between them. Um, in theory, a unit test uh, tests one unit in isolation from everything else in the system, um, and each test should be independent of, of every other test. Um, and usually a unit means you're testing one function or, or one method of an object at a time. Um, you use things called stubs and mocks, which I won't get into, uh, to simulate the other components that are needed uh, by your component, the lower levels of, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're testing a method that requires, uh, that in turn calls other methods or functions, you need to provide something that implements those, and maybe even in the case of a mock, we'll make sure that it was called correctly as part of the test. Um, most of the tests that I'm going to show are more on the functional side. Oops, I changed my settings on my trackpad here. Um, so, um, integration testing uh, and integration functional testing kind of blend between them. It means you're testing the interaction of multiple components. Uh, sometimes you're doing that with a full install of your system. Sometimes you've got a test <coughs> harness that just loads a couple of the components. Um, a real classic example of integration testing is when you're testing uh, database code. It's really hard to test database code without your database. So if you're running against an Oracle database or a Postgres database and you want to write, run some tests, you generally need to have the database there. So that's almost always an integration test. Functional testing will test a complete system. Um, classic examples of functional testing are a web API, which is uh, what I'm going to show. Uh, today, which is Bitcoin provides uh, the Bitcoin RPC interface that you can use to send web services commands to the Bitcoin daemon. Um, you can also test web pages. There's a framework called Selenium that lets you actually remote control a browser and, and use real browsers to test your web pages. And there are also test, uh, functional test frameworks that you can use to test, to test uh, GUI applications like mobile apps or desktop apps. Functional testing of Bitcoin is hard. 
um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, Bitcoin itself was designed to tie all the transactions together in order. Um, so every transaction is dependent upon previous transactions. We want to make sure there's no double spends. Uh, it operates as a peer-to-peer -peer network, and the idea is that there let there be only one and only one network. It requires a tremendous amount of processing power to write a new block on the network, and when we're testing, we want tests to run quickly. Um, and you have to wait an average of 10 minutes to write a, to write a block, and testing is generally about you make some change to the system, and then you make sure the system takes that change correctly, um, a stimulus response. Um, a little bit of background on MasterCoin. Um, it's a layer on top of Bitcoin. So we have uh, uh, an extension of the uh, Bitcoin daemon, the Bitcoin, also known as Bitcoin Core, that adds some higher level functionality to add additional currencies, uh, a distributed currency exchange to do crowd sales. There's a function called send to owner, which is somewhat similar to paying a dividend. There's also the concept of savings wallets, which are uh, wallets that have reversible transactions so your money can't be stolen. Um, but all those things build on top of the blockchain. So we have the same the same set of problems in testing MasterCoin as you have in testing Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has three modes of operation. Um, the main net is what we're all familiar with, what everybody's, I think everybody here should be familiar with if you're all uh, Bitcoin developers. Um, and that is the, the Bitcoin network that's, that's global and, and uh, has what, 12 million coins right now. There's also uh, a test net where you can configure your Bitcoin, uh, your Bitcoin daemon or your Bitcoin clients to talk to the test net. And it, it has fewer nodes, fewer transactions, and a much lower difficulty. So it requires less CPU to, to run against test net. And, uh, however, it still has a 10 minute block time. Um, oh, the other thing that I didn't mention in the testing is testing costs money if you want to do testing on the Bitcoin network. If you want to write a thousand transactions, that's a thousand times four cents, right? So if you really want to do, you know, some extensive testing, it, it actually, the meter's running the whole time. Um, the test net reduces that because the test net coins, you can get them for free, um, but you still have to wait 10 minutes and you're still tied to a network. Also, if you're using real money to test and you screw you know, if the test fails, which is... <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So there's plenty of, I mean, you can see too, it's in the blockchain, like people have destroyed lots of money by testing. <laughs> yeah, I have a real funny story. At MasterCoin, we have a security consultant too, and he actually did this on the test net, but he, uh, he created, one of the things you can do in MasterCoin is to find a new coin, and he created a coin called Exploit Coin. <laughs> and of course, that immediately went out into the testnet blockchain, and now all MasterCoin clients have to uh, make sure they can handle ex uh, exploit coin. Um, so Bitcoin 0 0.9 added <coughs> something called reg test mode. How many people are familiar with reg test mode? One? Three? Two? Three? Four? four? Okay. Reg test mode is really cool if you're doing testing. Um, it's, it's basically a configuration that you can put either on the command line or in bitcoin.conf and it lets you create your own blockchain locally on your system. Um, so you basically you can, start, uh, you can start on block zero and create your own genesis block and you can mine as many coins as you want. Um, there's, a, there's actually an RPC command that you can send to the daemon saying mine a block. And and when that block is mined, you get issued the coins. So you can use those coins in your test. Um, so it gives, you, it gives you complete control, it gives you unlimited wealth, and you don't have to wait 10 minutes for, uh, for a block confirmation. You can also, with reg test mode, you can hook up multiple demons if you like, and you can do things like uh, simulate um, reorgs or forks of the blockchain if you want to test code to make sure it handles that. 
So it's a really, it's a really nice feature that's in uh, Bitcoin 0.9 and later, and it's really useful for, for testing your software. Uh, it, if you look at uh, Bitcoin Core, they have some other testing that they're doing uh, besides the reg test mode. They have a set of unit tests written in C++. There's a, there's a popular framework called Boost that Bitcoin uses fairly heavily, I believe. I'm not a, a, a core developer for either Bitcoin or Master, MasterCoin. Um, but there's a C++ test framework that has what what are, what are true unit tests that run and test individual functions. Um, there's also some Python scripts. A lot of those actually do work against reg test mode and they generate various transactions. I spent some time looking through it and it didn't seem to be uh, very fully automated or documented. Um, if anybody has information on that, <laughs> otherwise I'd love to hear about it. Um, there's also a pool tester that uh, automatically checks, uh, runs some tests on changes that are in pull requests to, to Bitcoin. And I, I wasn't able to find too much more about that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Bitcoin J because I, I use it to some extent in, in this work. Uh, Bitcoin J is one of the leading alternate implementations of Java. I'm sorry. One of the leading alternate implementations of Bitcoin. Um, its main focus is for Android wallets. Um, the leading Android wallet is the Andreas Schildbach Bitcoin wallet, which is the, the biggest install. And he's a major contributor to, to Bitcoin J and, and uh, the wallet is also open source. If you dig through the Bitcoin J code, it uses uh, a Java unit test framework called JUnit, which is sort of the granddaddy of all unit test frameworks. And if you look at that code, it's a little verbose as Java can be. Um, and I, I, I'll show you uh, an example of that when I get down to the, to the code part. So Groovy, inner Groovy. Uh, Groovy is a Java-like language um, without a lot of verbosity. There's a famous Groovy demo where they take the Java hello world of 20 lines and they boil it down to one line. <laughs> Uh, but yet, it's very compatible with, with Java. The syntax is a superset. You can take a .java file, rename it .ruby, and start yanking out code. Um, and it, it's well integrated with the JVM and with Java libraries. So for example, a Groovy string is, is actually a Java string. Uh, if you use JRuby or, or a Python on the, on the JVM, you've got sometimes to do conversions back and forth between your data structures because of different libraries that are being used. So Spock is a test framework written in Groovy and it's what's known as a domain specific language. So it actually kind of extends the language and creates uh, a custom vocabulary specifically for tests. So it's, it's, it's very expressive it also provides an expressive uh, mocking capability, which I will not be uh, showing tonight, as I'm going to be showing mostly in, uh, integration tests. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move over to my IDE now. Everything's really tiny because of the uh, projection mode that we're in. So I'm just going to dive into a Spock test here that, um, that does some basic Bitcoin operations. Um, this one runs in reg test mode. Um, so I have a class called Bitcoin stepwise spec. Um, and this is, a, this is a Java class, but also a Groovy class. Um, it, these shared variables are used between tests. Um, the, the setup spec is a method that runs before any of the individual tests run. 
Um, and what this does is it creates a secure, um, a secure random number. Um, no, I'm sorry, I should explain this. Um, one of the things that I did in these unit tests, even though I am using reg test mode, I, it's still not practical to completely restart everything every time. In order to, to run tests in reg test mode, you need to mine 100 blocks. Does anybody know why? You can't spin it until you've, you can't spend the block reward for 100. Yeah, new, new, newly mined coins can't be spent for 100 blocks. So although in reg test mode, you create a new blockchain and you can start mining from block zero, you have to go through 100 blocks before you can spend any of those coins in a test. And that, takes, that actually takes a couple minutes. So when, when, you're, when you're developing, you, d you don't really want to, to wait a couple minutes every time you rerun your test. So I've, I've written these tests so that they can run independent of the, of the test history. Um, so what I do is I create a random account name and I create new addresses so I can be assured that they have zero balances. Rather than, for example, having a hard-coded address, which would, um, which I wouldn't be able to reuse because it would have a transaction history on it. So this setup spec method here creates a, a unique address in a dedicated Bitcoin uh, account within the Bitcoin D daemon. So the account name is a random number, and then get account address just generates a a brand new Bitcoin address. So this is, should is, uh, this is bad. <laughs> it's, it's funny, there's a guy named Rob Fletcher who does some really nice talks on Spock. And he, he uh, I was looking at the slides for one of his talks before I actually saw it. And this was something he recommended people not use. Um, <laughs> uh, saying should at the beginning of a test. So one of the things that Spock does that's, that's, uh, that's really unusual, but very useful for unit testing, is it allows you to have method names with spaces in them. So what you're looking at here, be able to find wealthy account from mining profits, that's actually a, a function name. Now why would you put spaces in a function name? Normally that's probably not a good idea, but when you use test, when you use test tools like Jenkins that generate test reports, they actually use the method name in the, in the reports. And since that's what people are reading to see the results, it actually makes them a lot more readable if you can put the spaces in the method name. So Spock adds to the, to, to the Groovy language these when and then operators and, and a handful of others, uh, specifically for testing. So the when, uh, the when label gets, uh, uh, you, you can put a string after it to explain what you're doing. And it, it basically gives the stimulus of the test and the then says after you've done that, what do you expect? And what follows the then, what follows the then label are actually uh, assertions. So they're, 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 they're conditions that must be true if the test succeeds. So what you see here is a send to address from the wealthy address and then it specifies a certain amount of coins to send. Generate block tells Bitcoin to write a new block and it takes a matter of seconds to, to write a block uh, or less than a second. Um, and then after that block is written it checks the balance and makes sure that the uh, that our account with the wealthy address now has the right amount of Bitcoin in it. So we're able to, we're able to send coins and, um, and then see that the right balance ended up uh, in, in, the, in, in the account that we sent it to. And what's happening here is it's sending, the coin, it's sending newly mined coins. There's another test which, which sends, um, 
which then sends from this wealthy address, it sends it to um, So we set up an initial balance, we calculate the wealthy start balance uh, by getting the balance of this account name that we generated. Um, then uh, we need to create a new address and we're going to send some funds to it. Um, so these aren't, these aren't newly mined, this is, this, these tests are called stepwise, so they're actually executed in order, which lets me tell a story. So, um, so this win condition here, uh, we create yet another address, and then we send from our account name to the destination address, the test amount, uh, we generate one block. And then we make sure that the new address has the right amount, and the old address is poor by the, by the same amount. I did, didn't do that in the previous test, which was using newly mined coins because, that, because the balance of that account varies depending upon what block number we're actually running the test on. Again, I'm not, I don't want the test to depend upon resetting the blockchain and rerunning uh, from the start because that just takes too long. So I want to be able to right click on the test, run it, fix a bug, right click on it and run it again. So I can't, I can't control the balance from mining profits. I can control the balance in an individual account. Any, any questions at this point? I have a question about the generate blocks. The default, you know, what, how, so generate blocks just takes an argument of number of blocks to generate? Yeah, there's actually two versions of it. You can see I have one that doesn't take the argument and just generates one block. One by default, and then you can specify an integer <clears throat> number. But, but in the normal Bitcoin client, if you set it up this way, it'll generate to a new, you know, randomly generate an address and mine to that. So what address does this generate block mine to? Right, like the default, if you just run Bitcoin D and you, like, do dash R or whatever the, the command line is to, like, mine, it'll just make new wallet addresses and mine to those. Yeah, Reg Testmos does, does the same thing. There's, yeah, Bitcoin has, I think, a somewhat poorly implemented version of a uh, concept of accounts inside mm -hmm. the RPCs. And so the mining goes to the default account, which is named with an empty string. So, but that keeps generating new addresses or it like reuses an old one? You know, I actually don't know the answer to that. I just know that they're in the default account. I think it generates new addresses, but I'm, but I'm not sure. Okay. And the, this just does whatever, this, the default Bitcoin. Default yeah, account. yeah. So, so what I do for test purposes is I move the coins from that default mm. address, that default account, into a newly created account that only has one address in it. I get it. And now I'm able to control the balances exactly, even at an arbitrary point. In, in the blockchain. Um, I guess I should talk a little bit about um, what the various components of the system are. Um, if I drill down on this generate block, you can see that it then calls generate blocks one. Um, and that actually calls something called set generate. And this is the actual RPC that you're probably familiar with from the command line. Um, set, it, it's one of the few Bitcoin RPCs that actually is kind of overloaded. Normally when you're not in reg test mode and you call set generate, it, it, I think it turns mining on and off. Um, when you're in uh, reg test mode, it actually says mine block. So, the, um, so you always specify true for the first, for this Boolean of generate, and you specify a, uh, a, a, a long that's the number of blocks to generate. So you can actually tell it to generate, you know, like when I start it up, I tell it, I give it a single command and tell it to mine 100 blocks. Um, 
So just a little bit of review. Um, so here's a, here's a, uh, can, can it, uh, that might be hard to see somewhere. Um, I could probably resize the window to, to bring that up. Can everybody see that last command with the very bottom line there? Mm -hmm. um, so you can see there's a get block count command. Um, this is this is the way that you invoke the RPC commands from the command line. There's a tool called Bitcoin CLI that's part of the Bitcoin distribution, and you can pass it various commands. Get block count doesn't have any arguments. Um, and what what I've done for the Java tests is I've written a library that b builds up those same requests that I can use from the tests. Um, and I tried to, I have two versions of it, one of them that uses camel case syntax um, that's kind of more Java-like, and then I have another version that, that tries to look more like the, uh, the command line tools themselves. Um, so in order to, so basically in order to run these reg test, tests, I have a shell script which starts Bitcoin D or Master Core D, which is the, the Master Coin enhanced version of Bitcoin D. It starts it in reg test mode, and then you just leave it running in reg test mode. Um, and then the tests use the RPC library to, to send the various commands um, and check the results. I'm going to um, mix things up a little bit here by talking about Jenkins. Um, how many people are familiar with, with the Jenkins uh, server? Yes. One, two, three, okay. All right, um, then, I'll, then I will provide some explanation for the majority. So the Jenkins uh, server is a, uh, what's called a continuous integration server. It's an open source server. Um, it's, uh, it's written in Java, and it runs, uh, there's packages available for it for, uh, for Ubuntu and various uh, machines. You can, you can find services on the web that, that let you run it directly, or you can install your own. And what Jenkins' main job is you can point it at your code repository, and it can watch for when code is checked in, and then automatically test that code. Um, so if you look here at this test, this is actually Bitcoin Core, which is an unmodified uh, version of the Bitcoin. Uh, this is coming right out of the master branch of the Bitcoin project. And this, so that's what this job does. If I log in, and I go into the configuration for this Jenkins job, you can see, um, down here are the commands that are run. Can everybody see that? And then what I've got highlighted there. So this is this is uh, how you build and test Bitcoin itself. Um, it runs a, a handful of command line tools, the main one being make, and then it runs this built executable called test Bitcoin and specifies to output the logs in an XML format. So this Jenkins server is configured to go out and check to see if code was checked into Bitcoin and then run, run these tests and then it, it builds a, uh, <coughs> it, uh, let me find it here, the latest test result. Here you can see all the tests that it run that it has run. Notice there's no spaces but underbars in these tests. And these are the, these are the Bitcoin, um, the Bitcoin Core Boost C++ unit test results. Um, this is a server that I set up for MasterCoin. So you also see I have MasterCore as well. And if I look at a project here, you'll see that it's running very similar test results 
from, oops, I clicked on the wrong one. So those are unit tests. The, um, the reg test tests you can see are here. Um, I have one that's failing. So blue means green <laughs> in Jenkins. Does anybody know why? Color blindness. Uh, the creator is Japanese. And I, I believe in Japan at one point they actually had uh, blue, uh, the, the, the light, the traffic they, they call it, it's green, but they call it green blue. They do? Yeah. Huh? Like if the actual photons coming off of a stoplight are the same wavelength as here, but they call it a blue light, not a green light. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Bitcoin, got the, the, the guys from Jenkins said it's blue. Maybe they're just making up an excuse. Anyhow, blue is green, red is red. Um, and then, so you can see by looking at the test, blue is success. What about blue then? Huh? Now I'm really confused. Um, so so, the, so the, the blue or the red says whether the last run was a success or failure. The uh, second column here shows a history, whether it gives you, it's like, like the, rack, the last six runs. So I'm gonna, going to dive into the, um, the master coin um, reg test results and we can see what was generated by Spock. So here you can see we have generate a block upon request, get a list of unspent transactions, send an amount to a newly created address, return basic info, and all those tests have passed. So those are the, the Spock methods that you saw with, uh, with, with, with the spaces in them. One of the other uh, interesting things that we're doing for Master Core is we're actually doing what are called consensus testing where we look at multiple implementations or multiple versions of, of, a, of the same implementation and we look at all the balances of all the addresses of a particular currency. So MasterCoin lets you create multiple currencies as a layer on top of Bitcoin. So the, the fundamental currency of MasterCoin is called uh, MasterCoin, MSC. There's also something called Test, in, test MasterCoin and then people can create coins like made safe coin, things like that. And each coin has a specific, uh, you know, it can be some are divisible, so, you know, in other words, um, real values, just like Bitcoin down to eight decimal places. And some of them are held to be integers if, they represent, if they're gonna represent physical units of property that aren't subdividable or something like that. Um, this is the uh, test result trend of the consensus um, and if I, if I go into the results you can see that for for MasterCoin these are actually all the individual tests that were run <laughs> and each there's actually thousands of them and it's actually testing every at the balance of MasterCoin for for every Bitcoin address in the system there's the volume isn't as large for MasterCoin as it is for Bitcoin would be uh, it would be a little bit a little bit different story with, with with millions of addresses but currently for MasterCoin there's only thousands of addresses um, so it actually goes through and checks and because MasterCoin has a variety of transaction types um, and we and we add new transaction types that, that can affect balances it's really useful to the developers to be able to see if a particular implementation gets broken under under a particular transaction type. So we're actually uh, auditing the, uh, everybody's balances across multiple implementations. Um, I think I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna actually show how we do the balance comparison because it's kind of an interesting use of Spock. And then I think I'm going to wrap up and, and just go to any, to any remaining questions.
Since, so one of the really nice things you can do with Spot is they have this, this annotation called Unroll. And this is, uh, this is the test that we do in MasterCoin for every currency. We, um, we, we compare, uh, this comparison is a, is a custom type that is generated by the test that contains every address for that particular currency. And so this, this is what's called a data-driven test. So this, this comparison uh, gets iterated and it has thousands of addresses in it. It compares the, the entry from one implementation versus the entry from the other and compares them for equality and generates a custom test with that name that you see in the output, um, testing that balance. So if, if there's a thousand balance mismatches, you have a thousand failing tests. So you can see that, you can see that in that histogram. Uh, if, if there's a fairly, you know, if, 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 if an error affects a lot of balances, it will show up in the histogram as thousands of, of failing tests. Um, this is a useful feature of Spock that you can use for, um, if, you, if you have, you know, like any kind of arith arithmetic operation and you want to have a table of data to make sure that it handles negative numbers or positive numbers, you can build that table of data and, and feed it into the test and reuse the same test over and over again without duplicating any code. You just have the data coming from a table. Um, again, this comparison uh, comes from actual queries uh, either to a web service or to the RPC, uh, uh, to an RPC, RPC method inside of uh, Bitcoin itself. Or um, I should say master core, which is, uh, which is essentially a, a Bitcoin with extra features. Okay, that's, I think I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs>
uh, I think I, I think still think there's room for improvement. I could. It seems to me that testing, you know, people think of it as something that just is sort of this necessary nuts and bolts that needs to be done to make sure things are going well. But also, I, you know, people can use tests to 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 learn about Bitcoin. I mean, really to uh, see sort of from a bird's eye, you know, with. With the kinds of tests you have there, you know, it's very readable. You can really get a sense for what's going on at a very abstract level and then drill down to see exactly how it's all put together. Yeah, that's really common in, in the Groovy space. I can, show, um, I can actually show where I was playing around with uh, Bitcoin J. I wanted, uh, there are some tests that I've written where I use Bitcoin J to generate a transaction and then I send it as a raw transaction mm -hmm. to the RPC. And I didn't really know how to do that. Um, and, and so you can, when you work in an IDE like this, um, So here's an example with uh, a simple example with Bitcoin J. Um, so these are just some tests that I wrote to learn about how Bitcoin addresses are handled in, in Bitcoin J. So here's a, a test definition that says create a valid mainnet address from a private key. Um, oh, this is uh, <laughs> it's a not so private private key. So in this case, don't ever use this address. I actually have a, uh, a private key right here, and I create a, uh, a Java big integer uh, from that, uh, and then I pass that into elliptic, elliptic curve key, which is a Bitcoin J class, to create a private key. Um, then uh, there's a function in Bitcoin J called to address where I, you take, it takes a key. Since a Bitcoin address has a leading character that says whether it's mainnet or testnet, um, you have to specify which net you want. So from, the, so from the elliptic curve key, it generates a Bitcoin address. And then here, be, uh, because it's not random, I know that this is the address that's gonna be generated from that private key. And I verify that uh, the, the the correct uh, address was generated. I make sure I test its version and I make sure that it was in fact made with the main net uh, parameters. Um, here's the, some tests for the EC key. This one I went into a lot of detail. Um, maybe I can make this a little bigger. So here I create an EC key based on a random number. So now I can't check to make sure it generated the right address because I, I, if I did, then I'd be really, if I could do that, I'd be really rich. Um, so I create a new EC key and then I just make a bunch of asserts about its behavior. I say, well, the key has a private key which returns a Boolean of true. The test would fail if that didn't work. Um, it is not a public key only. Its length is 256 divided by eight, 32 bytes. Um, I just make a bunch of assertions about what's in this object. So it's a great way to, um, it's a great way to, to kind of learn an API. You can, you can easily write these things. You can, you can play around with stuff. And, you know, to run this, I just right click on it and say, run the test. I can see that all those asserts passed. So in, in the Groovy space, it's pretty common for people to document stuff by just showing a, a code sample of how, uh, uh, you know, of how to initiate and an initialize an object or something like that, and then provide a bunch of asserts like this that show uh, things that you know to be true about it. And it, it is a great way to learn. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can get the papers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions?
Uh, uh, forgive the uh, non-technical uh, presentation of my question because I'm not terribly technical myself. But I noticed on um, on YouTube there is a there is a clip from a, from a conference, and there was a presenter there discussing Bitcoin from Mastercoin and another one from Counterparty, mm -hmm. and they were both in an agreement that it would be really nice if someone would create a blockchain, a blockchain which could carry more user user data on it. And I'm curious if, if you're familiar with that issue and if you care to speak about it. In, in great depth. I'm familiar with it. I'll speak about it carefully because <laughs> yeah. um, I, I don't know that I'm, I'm not really involved on the details, mm -hmm. but it's it's a controversial subject and, mm -hmm. and both uh, MasterCoin and Counterparty are doing the same thing, which is putting extra data into the extra data into the blockchain that represents more than just a simple Bitcoin transaction. Yeah. Um, some people consider that spam. Mm -hmm. uh, there, you know, some, some, some of the core Bitcoin developers don't approve of that. They think we should really focus entirely on the core mission of Bitcoin and not build other things on top of it. Yeah. But maybe that's like saying, gee, we should never put HTTP <coughs> on top of TCP. You know, we, we're trying to build a new financial system. We have these core layers that are reusable. The question is, how do you get the, the, the reward system right and get the game theory right for uh, so that everybody pays their fair share and gets rewarded appropriately? So the, the initial version of MasterCoin actually um, caused real problems for uh, the, the initial, the original transactions actually created UTXOs, um, which are transactions that can never be spent, that would have to be indexed by the miners. So they moved away from that and created a way that avoided that. There's a, there's a, there's a thing that's in Bitcoin now called op return, which lets you put 40 bytes of data right. in a transaction that um, that can be pruned, that the miners don't have to don't have to keep. But that's not, but, but uh, MasterCoin can't fit in that right now. They wanted more bytes than 40. So there's, there's an ongoing debate about whether to, I heard maybe they might bump it back up now. I'm not sure. But the idea is that you should pay a transaction fee to the miner to sort of cover the cost of that, of that transaction. And there's, there's an ongoing debate about that. And I'm not sure how it's going to play out. Tarek? Yes, yes, yes. What's, what's, what's the word on that in, uh, in the counterparty space, do you know? Uh, with regards to miners' fees on and block, block, you know, blockchain pollution or oh, it's bullshit. Uh, op return. Yeah, bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. Um, so we're actually uh, we just talked to Dex today. We're gonna do, um, you know, we're gonna work together to actually. Um, he's done some research on on the number of uh, Bitcoin counterparty, Chance Coin, Master Coin transactions in the blockchain and showing them as a percentage of all, you know, uh, quote unquote, um, you know standard slash bare multi-sig type transactions. And so far what we've seen is that the volume attraction on the transactions is very low. And also um, the miners who are filtering out um, the uh, transactions are very, what we call low terahash hash miners. So it's more ideological miners. So the big miners are still, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're in, we are aligned with their interests because we're essentially paying them for those transaction fees. So I think what we're gonna see as the halving comes um, is that um, these types of transactions now we look to to generate more revenue for miners. Miners are going to be looking to them to say, hey, you know, we need to <laughs> make some more money. And I think um, because the value of those transactions are even higher than some normal Bitcoin transactions, um, we'll see some flexibility in the fees. The same way JR, who was the founder of MasterCoin, envisioned it in that, you know, sooner or later the miners will start, you know, um, partnering with people who can actually pay more of a th fair share for the security of the network. So yeah, we're going we're gonna to also present that at Money 2020, talk about you know, the truth of, uh, you know, um, blockchain spam from these types of transactions. Cool. You might see a, a growth in bundled transactions where miners accept blocks of transactions in mass yep. uh, and will pay minor exchange fees so that they can get all of the uh, return out of those individual transactions. Yep. So. Yep. Now, were you going to uh, talk about Bit, BitPay, uh, testing at BitPay? Testing in general? Um, so as far as our open source projects are concerned, uh, we've got, you know, obviously Bitcore, Copay, Insight is our primary three open source projects. Uh, Bitcore being a JavaScript library, we try attempt to utilize as many of the same fixtures that Bitcoin Core itself uses. 
so that we can validate, because we use BitCore in pretty much every product that we produce, we just simply use the same set of fixtures, validate we produce the same outputs. Um, and there's a number of tools and frameworks we use. Uh, you can check our GitHub page, of course, just to, to validate these things. Um, if, I'm, if you'd like to ask a specific question about how we run tests, um, how we make sure that our engineers are writing tests, we only accept pull requests that in increase test coverage uh, in our code base. If you decrease test coverage, we do not accept your pull request, uh, just because we want to make sure that all of, the, all of the features and improvements that ship to our code uh, increase code coverage and, and run appropriate tests because that's the only way that a volatile protocol, honestly, as protocols sort of change over time, can be validated is if you are very strict and stringent about your testing processes. So I'm open to any questions that you guys might have about specific things that we do, whether internally or as part of our open source processes. That's absolutely open to them. Eric, do you know which uh, tools you're using for testing? Uh, so for client-side testing, I think we use uh, Karma combined with uh, Mocha in mm -hmm. the browser. Mm -hmm. We bind that into a lot of stubs in our Angular stuff for Insight. Uh, we, we also use Mocha, Should, Chai uh, for our internal testing. These are all Node.js modules, mind you. So we have a very specific subset of tests that we run. Um, those are all run automatically through Travis. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also use an, a, a framework called Istanbul, uh, which is another Node.js project that will uh, run our code coverage for us. In fact, it links into Node.js on top of the Mocha tests and just measures each individual line, each statement, each function that runs. Uh, we can validate whether or not that statement is covered uh, by those individual tests. Uh, we run those automatically using a tool called Coveralls. Uh, which will automatically, uh, for our open source projects, co coveralls will automatically update the status of a pull request. It'll say, like, this specific commit has 93.2% coverage. This next commit reduced coverage by 0.2% because you introduced these many lines of code. You didn't write tests for that. So coveralls.io, uh, Travis CI uh, is another tool we use to automate those, those things. Uh, for our internal tools, we we attempt to run as many of the same frameworks as possible. Just because as we, we, we feel that if you're building a, a company, right, whether it be internal, public, or not, uh, you want to start with the assumption that your team is distributed, that nobody within your company can see each other face to face. And if you build all of your processes based on that assumption, you end up with a much more efficient communication mechanism, you end up with a better way of collaborating on code and you end up with better test coverage ultimately uh, because people are basically forced to communicate through the metrics that they're, of the code that they're sharing. Um, so we, we make it part of our culture to do the testing first. Um, we, don't, we don't do test driven development in that we don't necessarily write the tests first, um, but in terms of contributions and things that are accepted into the main core product, uh, you have to ship tests with your code. Uh, so. Are you doing uh, all, all different levels, unit, uh, integration, functional, uh, some more than others? Or? Yeah, so, so this is actually much more applicable on our <clears throat> core product, the payment processing engine, um, where we have a very regimented set of unit tests. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have, have um, uh, integration tests that basically do a full-on user experience where it spins up a from vanilla copy mm -hmm. of BitPay, actually. Uh, we'll run all of the, the unit tests, test coverage, but then also we'll run user tests. Can a, can a user apply to our platform? Can a user set up their settlement information? Can a user do these things? So we verify all these things end to end. Now additionally, uh, now with the shipping of our new API, uh, it, with the new cryptographically secure stuff, we've added a secondary layer of testing, which includes Ghost as a browser framework. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, PhantomJS is what we're using. PhantomJS. PhantomJS uh, to basically spin up a whole like DOM with executable JavaScript oh. to verify that everything in the browser is interactable, there's no client-side JavaScript errors, that everything works just fine. Uh, and then we're running full end-to-end -end tests in addition to the integration tests, mm -hmm. uh, the client-side Angular stuff. Okay. So. That's a good testing story. <laughs> Make it part of your process or it's not going to happen. Uh, if you're starting a new project, start, start day one with shipping tests with your features. Uh, if you don't instill it at the beginning of your project, uh, we had a very difficult time because honestly in 2011 when the company was founded, we didn't have a rigid testing framework at all. Uh, we barely had version control. 
Now, that be, <laughs> uh, just being honest here, uh, as we move forward, like in order to get achieve the scale that we did, version control and testing becomes absolutely essential to shipping high quality products. Um, and making the migration from you know not having a good testing framework to having a very stringent testing framework was like pulling teeth, right? Because people are just used to just shipping code, shipping code, shipping code. Uh, so I would encourage everyone as early as possible integrate testing. Uh, don't enforce it in terms of process necessarily or, or like tools. Don't like f reject. Don't uh, like immediately close pull requests automatically without human intervention, uh, because. Processes are designed to be flexible. Uh, don't let the process get in the way of actually executing on delivering product, but do integrate it, do have the supporting tooling like Travis. Travis is a, probably one of the number one tools that, we, that has contributed to the quality of code at BitPay, just because it's sort of automatic and supplementary. And then we individually... Travis is like Jenkins, right? Yeah. Yeah, Travis, I think actually Travis is a, it's a startup, but it's a fork of Jenkins. Okay. Uh, which is running on their servers, uh, and then they provide it. Now they, they charge for private repos. It's a, it's actually kind of hefty. It's like 130 bucks a month uh, to do private repos because they really want to support the open source ecosystem, which BitPay also believes in. We want to as much as much as we can. We want to open source, and I would encourage everybody to do the same thing. Uh, there's a quote from I think it's Donald Knuth, who's one of the early contributors to computer science. Uh, he says, uh, "All bugs become shallow with a sufficient number of eyes." So if you, if you simply, I would recommend not only integrating testing, but making your stuff open source, because nothing can really replace uh, the quality of a human review on your source code. Even if your tests say that you have 100% coverage, nothing can replace the, the human aspect of being able to read the code. So. Thanks, sir. Do you want to do like a grab box of like topics or anything? Like that? <laughs> I don't know. What, one thing we were discussing before you you you, you came out was the, um, that that uh, back in 2011, I remember Gavin talking about how important testing was for various implementations, and I was just sort of wondering what the state of affairs was there. And uh, do you know anything about that? Really? Uh, as far as Bitcoin Core is concerned, about Bitcoin Core and various implementations. Is there any tests that? Maybe you know, it can be used in, for various implementations with different languages. And uh, not specifically. Uh, I do know that uh, over the next like year or two, we anticipate mm -hmm. things uh, getting into a very much more standardized format. Mm -hmm. uh, so like conformal with BTCD, with a, mm -hmm. which is a Go implementation. Yeah. Um, they're they're using some of the same fixtures, but not mm -hmm. all of the same because they got a different interface. Those mm -hmm. are the Python RPC fixtures, right? Python RPC fixtures. That's right. Um, so, so BTC doesn't implement all of those fixtures, um, but as we move forward, uh, one of our developers just submitted a new pull request to Bitcoin Core that includes, uh, it externalizes all of the internal calls in Bitcoin Core, which once that gets accepted upstream in oh, Bitcoin see, Core, uh, we'll start to see new frameworks hmm. evolve to test things from an external API perspective. Mm -hmm. And then we see several implementations, whether it be BTCD and Go, Bitcoin Core, uh, BitCore in JavaScript, whatever these tools are, mm -hmm. that secondary wave of test frameworks and fixtures that get added as a result of sort of exposing will eventually be considered the standard. So who are the people, I mean, where, is there sort of a, a group that's gelling that's that's sort of working on this kind of thing together and, and communicating? Uh, so it's, no, it's actually fairly decentralized <laughs> by principle. Um, yeah. No, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, sure. So, so uh, CHJJ, uh, Christopher Jeffries on our team, mm -hmm. uh, is really moving, moving the ball forward in terms of externalizing these libraries. Um, uh, Vlad, Vladimir is really pushing as far as testing is concerned. Um, honestly, the rest of the core devs aren't. Um, mm -hmm. they, they feel that the existing fixtures are sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, more, it's not necessarily going to be a, a focused effort by a number of developers. I think it's going to be more emergent than anything. Mm -hmm. So, All right, we'll see, um, I'm sorry, uh, what were their names? Uh, Christopher Jeffries, uh, he's on our team, uh -huh. and Vladimir, uh, okay. he's on, he's a Bitcoin core dev now. Uh, would they be open to people communicating with them? And a absolutely. Mm -hmm. I encourage you guys to participate as much as possible on the Bitcoin uh, dev mailing list, as, as maligned as it often is. Uh, also, uh, as you participate on GitHub with many other projects, 
participate, open issues against Bitcoin Core and say, hey, you know, I would like a test framework for this piece or a test for this piece. Uh, any of the Bitcoin projects, if they're on GitHub, is probably the best method of initial communication mm -hmm. because it then becomes a shared artifact rather than an email that you exchange with one other person or three or four other people, right? And a shared artifact, you, you, you have no way of measuring the future impact of a shared artifact, right? Because people can find it and search it, other people can contribute and say, oh, hey, that would be extremely useful for my project. Let's move forward and, and use that. So uh, I would encourage GitHub to be the primary mechanism for providing feedback or even adding your own testing framework, right? Uh, and then secondarily, contact people directly. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.